I am so excited to be here. There's so many cool talks and so many amazing people. This is just really a wonderful experience. I'm excited to, to talk with you. To Airflow, happy 10th birthday. I never know what to give a preteen, so maybe this is a, 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 good, a good present. We'll find out. All right, to all the future people walking, watching this on the internet on their laptops, dark mode presentation, don't worry. Anyone who wants to follow along, feel free to hit that QR code uh, if you can get it fast enough. So yeah, I am a, a principal data engineer. My name is Fritz, an astronomer. I've been at Astro for about three years. And uh, yeah, helping our customers with things like migrations, onboarding, developing tools and stuff like that to kind of help make our customers' lives easier. And I've been using Airflow for about twice that, which is really weird. <laughs> That's a, a long time to, to use a tool. But yeah, it's really wonderful and I, I love every minute of it. All right, so what are we here to talk about? We're here to talk about migrations. Specifically, migrations to Airflow. That's probably not surprising for the Airflow Summit. Who here has done a migration of an existing workflow to Airflow, right? All right, that's a decent chunk of hands that, that raised. Who here has done a migration for any of these tools, specifically to Airflow? All right, a little fewer. Yeah, so I'm gonna say something really contentious right now. Migrations can be difficult. <laughs> they're, they're not very fun to do sometimes. But migrations also can be really necessary, right? So also just to really quickly mention, there's been a couple talks at the Airflow Summit. There's been amazing blog posts, white papers, stuff like that, that'll go more into detail on how to do a migration, kind of the structure of it and stuff like that. And I'll actually link those at the end of this talk. So feel free to kind of check those out. Really great resources. So migrations, difficult, right? They're risky. Migrations must be exact. Otherwise, your critical pipelines can fail, right? If you're off by even a little bit. Migra migrations can be boring. Probably not gonna get you a promotion, maybe they will. They might get you a blog post. Migrations rarely move the bottom line necessarily and they rarely provide immediate business value. Migrations can be really complex. You need to be an expert in both the system you're migrating from and the system you're migrating to at an extremely critical time, right, when you're kind of moving these things. They can be really slow. They can be really difficult to scope. You kind of don't know, you know, unknown unknowns. There's a lot of minutia in this stuff, things that you don't expect necessarily. Migrations kind of suck. Airflow does not suck. I think Airflow is great. I want more people to use Airflow and people will get really excited when they can. So how do we make this simpler, right? How do we make this better? How do we make this easier? How do we make this faster? There are various tools out there. I wanna even highlight the first one. There's gonna be a wonderful talk tomorrow morning. Please everyone attend that. Um, but yeah, various tools out there that can kind of help automate some of this stuff, kind of help maybe address a little bit of, you know, all the negative stuff that I was just mentioning. Uh, there's more tools than these, uh, certainly. Some of these tools uh, are maintained. Some of the tools out there in general are maintained. Uh, some are open source, maybe some aren't. Maybe you need to talk to a salesperson or something like that before you can even take a peek at whether or not it does what you need it to do. Um, some of these do do what you need them to do. Some of them maybe you can customize to your use case and maybe not, you know, they're uh, more or less extensible. Just really quickly to also go get everyone on the same page and just go through this real fast. So generally, I, I have done quite a number of migrations with our customers, and just in general as a data engineer, and generally the process is like this, right? So initially you set up, right, before you even touch anything. You wanna kind of identify the new system that you're moving to. You wanna set up any networking infrastructure, authentication, stuff like that. You wanna identify and group the workloads that you're gonna be moving, right? You might wanna find common patterns that they have. Maybe there's a lot of workloads that all rely on Spark or something like that. Maybe they have common stakeholders, right? Maybe there's a data team. So you'll wanna make sure that you're talking to them. Or maybe they're related, maybe this workload needs to run before that one, so you need to be careful with that during the migration process. And then you migrate, and you migrate, and you migrate, and you migrate. Maybe you have tens, maybe you have hundreds, maybe you have thousands of workloads. And in each of those, right, so you wanna group them. In each group, you'll kind of just do this process again and again. You'll translate, you know, you'll look at the original version, maybe this is running a Spark a job, maybe this is running a SQL query, and how do you turn that into the same thing in Airflow? Uh, once you figure that out, you test, you deploy, you repeat, you repeat, you repeat. After, finally, you're done, um, and I always recommend this, then you can actually start to really adopt uh, the new tool, right? You can to have, finally have Greenfield, once everything is moved over, you can maybe do refactoring and uh, accommodate some of the benefits of the tool that you've adopted. All right, so everybody, let's do a quick exercise. Let's do a, a little bit of theater of the mind, if you will, if you'll come along with me on this. 
Uh, so quick, some positive affirmations, right? We are amazing data engineers. Our CTO wants us to adopt new technology. Just some, some quick affirmations. So yeah, let's pretend, for instance, uh, we have thousands of data pipelines. We're a large organization. We're maybe on a, a more of a platform team kind of responsible for that overall. Those data pipelines are showing their age, but they're also extremely critical. Like the CEO is gonna call someone if they don't run. Scaling has become impossible or something like that. Pager duty is going off weekly. You hear that ringtone in public and you shiver a little bit. So maybe those pipelines are Uzi, for instance. Uh, maybe you were really big into uh, Hadoop uh, 10 years ago. So yeah, if we have a thousand of these, right, uh, we're lucky if it's Uzi or something like that, right? If this is a structured workflow, if this is a structured text file, we're great data engineers. We know how to program, we can program this. So maybe we'll, we'll collect a bunch of these workflows, we'll get some examples, and we'll start to dive in and look at this. You can already initially see, maybe if you've got some sharp eyes, some of this might look like Airflow, right? Here's maybe something that could be a DAG ID, here's maybe something that could be a schedule, here's maybe a start date. There's some like timeout and concurrency settings, that's pretty cool. And then yeah, here we get into the meat of it and there's different tasks, right? So we can already kind of, doing this practice, start to identify how we might turn this into a DAG, at least if you're more familiar with that. Um, to call out on this slide and a, a prior summit, there was an amazing talk. I got this picture from that great link to click, just to call that out. So this is Control M. Control M can be exported as JSON or XML, same kind of thing, right? So this is JSON, I hate looking at XML, so I gave you a different example. But yeah, same kind of thing, right? So we have, as we can see over here, we have some schedule kind of stuff. And then maybe this is something like a DAG, we can get the DAG ID from this. We have a comment, that's pretty cool. And then different types of tasks again, right? So what do we need to turn this into, right? What's the, the outcome of our migration? Well, a DAG, right? Anyone who's familiar with Airflow has probably seen something like this. So yeah, we, we you know, have our structure, we have our schedule, of course the DAG is Python code, which is different from what we were just looking at. There are other things that we might need. We might need system dependencies, we might need Python dependencies. All right, so generally, the process, if we're gonna automate this, is gonna look something like this. We have a folder filled with structured workflows, maybe thousands of them. We need to do some kind of translation. And then at the other side, we get an Airflow project, right, with all of its dependencies, with all of its DAGs. All right, so let's, with our data engineering positive affirmations, kind of step into this a little bit more. I don't like XML. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find that library that turns XML into a Python dictionary and I'm gonna turn it into a Python dictionary. So I can actually start, you know, kind of slicing, filtering, things like that. A term that might make sense a little later with where I'm going with this, in compiler design, there's something called an intermediate representation. So we'll consider this Python dictionary our intermediate representation, right? This is just a common data structure that we can deal with. All right, step two. This, that was pretty easy. This is also pretty easy, right? I'm gonna make some quick functions, just little functions to figure out where's the thing that looks like a DAG, right? Where are the things that look like a task? I might, want, I might be iterating over a bunch, there might be a bunch of information I just do not care about. It just doesn't matter for what I'm producing. So we'll kind of use those to filter. Maybe give me a little bit of a pointer to what we're looking at. This is the hard part. Okay, how do we actually turn that thing that looks like a DAG into an Airflow DAG? Right, so we'll make another function. We'll make a couple functions at this point. Maybe, like we were just looking at earlier, we have something that looks like a schedule, right? And then, again, we have some stuff that kind of looks like a task. This one, we can tell, is just a bash command, right? This one is pointing to a file to execute a shell, shell script. So yeah, we can kind of see that, and we can, you know, taking it one at a time, this is the hard part, but taking it one at a time makes this problem a lot easier, right? I can look at just this little chunk of JSON, I can turn that into something that looks, you know, like an Airflow task. All right, to introduce some vocabulary, these little functions that we're making, I'm gonna call them rules. A rule is a Python function. It takes an input and it filters or it maps it, right? This specific input maybe turns into a SQL operator. A rule set is a collection of those rules. We probably wanna run them in order and we probably wanna group them, right? All these rules may be filtered as something that looks like a DAG. So we'll use those rules, we'll use those rule sets. You know, I've just added some tagging here just to kind of keep things neat to not lose my mind if we keep making a whole bunch more of these. We put them into those rule sets so we know how to run them in order 
And we have a little function up here that just knows you know, how to go from this to this to this to this to this. All right, so we're doing pretty good so far, right? Nothing too crazy, hopefully. Just little steps at a time so we keep our sanity. All right, now we want to build some objects, right? We have those functions, they know how to find, they know how to filter, and now they actually need to return something out of those functions. These objects are gonna store some state, and they will also know how to render themselves or turn themselves into Python, right? Airflow needs Python. So that's our, that's our output, so they'll kind of handle all that. This DAG object can render itself into a DAG. Python has a module called AST, which is actually a, a syntax tree, which is how it represents Python code internally. And we can utilize that to render syntactically valid Python code, which is pretty cool, in addition to kind of holding all that metadata. Yeah, so those, this operator maybe can turn itself into one of those SQL operators or a bash operator. And then, of course, knowing how to render its task dependencies as well. And then we're, we're pretty good, right? We're doing pretty good. We, we took this XML, we turned it into something, we ran a bunch of rule sets over it, we turned it into a Python code and an Airflow DAG. All right, adding just a little bit more, kind of linking everything together. So we'll put this into something called a, a project, right? So a project is just kind of holds everything. Project has DAGs, DAGs have tasks, tasks have dependencies, right? And then there's, there's other stuff too, right? There's connections, so, you know, if this SQL operator needs to talk to this database and this other SQL operator needs to talk to this other database, we probably need to know about that and, and handle that appropriately. So yeah, just extras, generally. And then, just one more thing. So yeah, that, there's this other team, right? It's the, the business analytics team or something, and they're actually saying, oh, I actually don't want that. You know, you made this, but for, for our Uzi workloads or whatever, we actually want an SSH operator instead of a bash operator. So can you change that? And you say, oh, okay, fine. So we extend our little process to take in different rule sets, right? So it can kind of mix and match as needed. Everybody, I have a confession. It's probably not that interesting of a confession. It was in the title of the talk. We've already made this. It's out there, it's open source. You can use it today, but you can you know, download it and run it on your machine. We've already used this to complete migrations with customers. We've migrated thousands of workloads in record time. Introducing Orbiter. I love cheeky names and cheeky taglines. So land your legacy workloads safely down into a new home on Apache Airflow. Orbiter can faster handle any system, right? Kind of using that, that process that we just went through in our little theater of the mind. Anything that can represent itself as structured something, right? We need, we need something to iterate over. We need something to find and filter. So that's a lot of systems, right? If it's all baked into a GUI and there's no way to get anything out, Orbiter's not gonna help. But yeah, that's a whole lot of systems, a lot of the ones that were in that very beginning and, and probably a lot of systems that you all might be familiar with today. Orbiter is extendable, right? It was built exactly like we said. People are gonna wanna change things, right? There's no one perfect migration. Maybe you need this property set on every operator. Maybe you need DAGs to be shaped like this instead of that. So yeah, Orbiter is built to be extendable. Those little Python functions, you can make your own. You can just pass them in. You can modify the rule set that might already exist, right? Batteries included. There's a bunch of rule sets already, and they're pretty easy to make if you need a new one. And then, yeah, just this part at the bottom, that's all you need to run Orbiter. That's pretty easy. But I'm actually gonna do a real quick demo. I'm pre-recorded because I am a coward. So yeah, Orbiter is super easy to install. Uh, you can install it via pip if your Python is up to date enough. Um, I think it requires uh, 310 or something like that. There's also um, a binary build, so if you don't have the right Python environment or something like that, uh, you can just download that. It's got Python embedded in it. Uh, there's a list rule sets command. We're keeping this up to date um, with all the rule sets that we know about. Uh, there's a couple systems in here, Dive Factory, Control M, Atomic Autosys, SSIS, so on and so forth, and it tells you exactly where to find them. There's an install command to install those rule sets, just flip by. But yeah, so you can just load that right into your orbiter. You can kind of just shove a brain right into it. We're looking at a, a gigantic thousand line control M job right now. If you have really sharp eye, eyes while things are scrolling, you might see things like success callbacks, airflow pools, bash commands and stuff like that, right? If you have really sharp eyes. But I know I scrolled through that pretty quickly. But yeah, we point Orbiter at that file we just looked at or a directory of those types of files. Orbiter will tell us about any errors that happen during the translation, right? It might not get everything. It tries to get as much as it can. It always tries to produce output. So it'll tell you about anything you might need to fix, and it produces those things we just talked about. With the Astro CLI, in just two commands, you have a running Airflow. Astro dev init, Astro dev start, 
handles all of it. We just went in like 30 seconds or something from a thousand lines of JSON to Airflow DAG, just like that. You can see the graph. I promise this is what it looks like in Control M, just the lines are different, their lines are more diagonal, ours are more square. But yeah, you could see in there, there was a whole bunch of bash operators all linked together. Handling that edge case, right, that other team doesn't want bash operators, they want an SSH operator. What do we do? So, it's as easy as this, right? We just need to make a different rule. Rules have a priority, they run in priority order, so we just make one that overrides the default rule, and it returns an SSH operator. Easy as that, we just need to know which property we need to put in, um, but we can even just look at the existing rule. So yeah, that's there. And then right after this, we can just rerun Orbiter, right? It's, it just is looking at a directory of text files and producing other files. We can run this as many times as we want. Because this is an SSH operator, there is now a new provider we need to install. However, Orbiter handles, handles all that for us, right? If you're new to Airflow, you might not know what the hell an SSH provider is, but Orbiter was smart enough to add that to our Python dependencies, and now we just do a quick restart. So we're installing that package, and boom, it's all there. These are all SSH operators. Now this is all rendering correctly. Airflow is not cranky with us because the provider's installed, and it was that easy. All right, that is that. Call to action, check it out, right? If this sounds good, you know, the docs are right there. I would love any feedback. Feel free to chat with us. Uh, if you have an upcoming migration, uh, talk to us at Astronomer, right? Uh, we have professional services, we would love to chat. Um, of course, you can use this tool without talking to us. It is free and open source. It is, uh, we would love for this to be a standard for the community to use. Um, there doesn't need to be 20 different tools, right? We can just plug configuration into a tool. Um, so yeah, if that sounds reasonable, uh, there's also this community translations repo. Um, if you do a migration, feel free to uh, push to it, right? If you have a rule set that makes sense um, for others to use, uh, you can always just uh, add a pull request right there.